Hello and welcome to the next lecture for our class. Today's topic will be the history of a local community, Idlewild, Michigan. Now today's approach is somewhat different because I'd like to use the history of Idlewild as a case study uh, to focus on the rich history of this community only about a half an hour or so from where the college is located. What we'll do is we'll place Idlewild within the context of American history and the history of Michigan. We'll start with some background first. Maybe we should begin with some geography. Just east of the college, about 25 to 30 minutes on US 10, is the community of Idlewild. It's circled here on this map. Idlewild is probably about five minutes east of Baldwin, just off of US 10. As you approach Idlewild, you'll see a yellow blinking light on US 10. To your right, or to the south, if you're going east, um, you'll see a nice entrance there uh, that was built a few years back in order to recognize the historic significance of the community. There's the welcome, uh, and then also a historical marker. It's important to understand some background or context to the history of Idlewild. So uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at some history of race relations in the United States and the history of segregation. Segregation based on race was confirmed by a Supreme Court decision in the 1890s called Plessy versus Ferguson. This dealt with the law in Louisiana where all railroad cars were segregated by law. The Supreme Court declared that separate facilities for people of different races were okay. They were legal as long as they were equal in quality. This gave us the so-called separate but equal doctrine. Once the Supreme Court declared that it was legal to segregate based on race, state and local communities passed their own laws. These were often referred to as Jim Crow laws. These were state and local laws that established segregation all over the country. Restrooms, drinking fountains, schools, movie theaters, sports stadiums, courtrooms were all segregated. People called this cradle to grave segregation because it began at birth, like with hospitals, and it didn't end with death because even funeral parlors and cemeteries were segregated. On the right, we see a pop machine. Even pop machines were segregated. I don't know if anyone has seen the film Green Book, but the title for that movie uh, was inspired by an actual book. The Negro Motorist Green Book was around for about 30 years, and it helped to identify places where African Americans could go to hotels, restaurants, gas stations, uh, if they were traveling to different areas throughout the United States. Businesses could legally say, no, we will not serve you. And the Negro Motorist Green Book uh, offered opportunities or areas where African Americans could be served. Here we see one of the inside pages of the Green Book uh, for the state of Michigan. Notice there are a handful of places in Ann Arbor and Battle Creek, several in Detroit, but then you get to Flint and Grand Junction. And on the right, we see Idlewild where there are numerous locations. One thing I'd also like to point out, um, notice there are none in Manistee, Ludington, or even a big city like Grand Rapids. I'd like to go back to this slide from earlier and reinforce another idea. Segregation was common throughout the United States from the years after the Civil War, late 1800s, through most of the 20th century. It's within this legal segregation that we see a unique thing develop in Idlewild, Michigan. So background or context of events is important to this local community just east of us. By the 19 teens, the recreation industry nationwide, but particularly in Michigan, was really in its infancy and it was starting to expand as people had cars. And so the state park system in the state of Michigan started in 1919. But this was an area where many whites were welcome, but not necessarily African-Americans. So 
A unique organization, the Idlewild Resort Company, was founded in the 19-teens, and it was organized by these men shown here. Their goal was unique. These four white men wanted to develop a resort for African Americans. I was lucky a few years ago to spend some time with the great-grandson of one of the founders of Idlewild. Essentially, what they knew was that African Americans were not welcome at many resort communities, and there was a niche market. They wanted to make money, is the bottom line. And so, although they were white, they knew that black patrons wanted to have recreation as well. And so, that was the motivation for the creation of Idlewild. These four entrepreneurs purchased property and they divided the property into very small plots so that they could sell them to at, affordable, at an affordable price to a wide range of people. Uh, typical plots were maybe 25 by 100 feet uh, and they sold for $35 each. You could buy them um, um, over time and put a little bit of money down and then pay a little bit each month. Property in Idlewild was promoted to a range of African Americans living in big cities in the Midwest, cities such as Chicago, Detroit, Indianapolis, Cleveland, or many others. What they would do is they would encourage people to uh, come go uh, visit on a tour bus ride, and this was free with no obligation, but they brought people to show the benefits of purchasing some property that was inexpensive in the beautiful area of Idlewild. We see an image of one of those tour groups on the right. Early housing there, if you didn't buy your own piece of property and build a cabin yourself, was uh, pretty rustic. Here we see a row of early cabins um, that came complete with two cots, a water pitcher, a basin, a hot plate, and a thunder mug. Well, uh, better known as a chamber pot. No running water uh, in those early cabins but it was fun nonetheless. Again, I'd like to provide a little bit of context. By the late 19-teens, the United States became involved in the First World War. And as a result of the war, uh, many African Americans moved to northern cities, maybe as many as 500,000 um, uh, by 1920. So uh, by the decade of the 1920s, over one and a half million African Americans worked in a range of factories in northern cities. And during the summer months, they wanted to respite from the heat. And so this uh, Idlewild became a place where people could go. Next, we'll identify some important residents who shaped the early history of Idlewild. On the right, we see an image of Leela Wilson. She and her husband, Herman, were important residents of Idlewild. They began to purchase property in the early 1920s, and they were part of uh, those excursions uh, from Chicago, and eventually they built a store, hotel, and even an important nightclub. The Wilson's home is still standing, and it's shown here, and there's a historical marker next to the home as well. Another famous Idlewild resident is shown here. This is Dr. Dan, or Daniel H. Williams. He was a doctor in the Chicago area, and he founded Provident Hospital. It was a hospital that accepted anyone of any race. Dr. Dan also was the first surgeon to successfully perform open heart surgery in the United States, and he did so in the 1890s. He was an important resident of Idlewild. Dr. Dan's home is still standing, it's shown here on the right, and there's also a historical marker outside of his property. When Dr. Dan grew older and he had to retire, he moved to his home permanently in Idlewild. He was known for his meticulous garden. When he died in 1931, just about everything came to a halt in the community and many people attended his funeral. On the right, we see another famous Idlewild resident, Madam C.J. Walker. She was the first black woman to become a millionaire. She made millions in the beauty industry. Uh, she had a range of makeup and hair care products that were geared toward African Americans. 
Black women had a different color skin, they had a different texture of hair as compared to white women, and there weren't many products that were geared toward African Americans. Well, she made a lot of money selling these specialized hair care and beauty products to women. She was a property owner at Idlewild. Again, I'd like to offer a little bit more background or context to events at Idlewild. American involvement in World War II began in 1941. As a result, over 700,000 African Americans left the South and they moved to communities in the North and the West. This shaped the history of Idlewild. The 1940s and 1950s were a boom time for Idlewild. On the left, on the top, you can see the Idlewild Clubhouse, which was a favorite spot for young people to congregate during the day. On the bottom, we see the Flamingo Bar, one of many nightclubs that were popular. By the 1950s, there were over a thousand summer homes in Idlewild and 13 churches. Numerous nightclubs offered entertainment for people. By the way, anyone was welcome to come to Idlewild. White, black, yellow, it didn't matter. Um, the Purple Palace and El Morocco uh, were two additional nightclubs. Well, each of you has an oral history that you're going to be doing or working on for this class. I conducted a series of interviews several years back with Idlewild residents. On the left, we see Leonard Wyatt, who was from Idlewild, lived there permanently. Jeannie Jones was from the Chicago area. And Mary Ellen Wilson also was from Chicago. I remember um, talking to Mr. Wyatt, and I asked him, um, did you ever go to one of those clubs, uh, you know, uh, in the 1940s and 50s? And he looked at me, and he said, every night. It wasn't the fact that he told me that he went to the clubs every night. It was the enthusiasm that was included in his voice. Idlewild was a who's who of African-American entertainers and visitors. There were people like Louis Armstrong who came. Della Reese, who you may or may not be familiar with from the show Touched by an Angel. She was a famous singer. The Four Tops got their start there. And um, the boxer Joe Lewis was a frequent visitor. The previous slide identifies just a few of the famous entertainers as well as visitors to Idlewild. On the left, we see a brochure um, identifying some of the, uh, of the great entertainment acts that would be visiting Idlewild in 1955. Phil Giles, as well as Arthur Braggs, organized many of the visitors and the entertainers uh, who would be there. While doing some research, I came across this newspaper article. This is just a, an example of a typical Idlewilder. Um, Carol Smith happened to live in New York, but because Idlewild was an important uh, spot for her family and they had come there every year, she decided to get married at Idlewild. Do I dare say a destination wedding from the 1950s? Kind of cool. Again, just a reminder, uh, many African Americans up until the 1960s were only welcome at resorts if they were part of the help. Idlewild was an example of one of many African American resorts where anyone was welcome, particularly African Americans, uh, where they could leave Jim Crow and segregation behind and just have fun. We see a range of those here on this map. Next, I'd like to talk about the bust and rebirth of Idlewild. The Civil Rights Movement in the United States began in the 1950s and it extended into the 1960s. On the right we see the events in Birmingham, Alabama when Martin Luther King Jr. led a series of nonviolent protests. These were caught on TV and had an impact on public opinion in the United States. Interestingly, the Civil Rights Movement had unintended consequences for Idlewild. As a result of Martin Luther King Jr.'s activities, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed. This outlawed Jim Crow laws and discrimination in public places. There was no longer a need for Idlewild because all resorts, all areas and communities would be open to African Americans. 
as I say, one of the results of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was that it had a negative impact on Idlewild. Since that time, Idlewild has declined as a tourist destination. Remember that clubhouse that I showed earlier? Well, this is what's left of it. It had to be torn down because it had deteriorated so much. Many of those nightclubs were also torn down. One of the only ones that's left is shown here. This is the Flamingo Club. Many of the rest are either torn down or they're in a really bad state of disrepair. Idlewild was founded as a tourist town. As the number of tourists decrease, unemployment rates skyrocketed, and the economy has suffered ever since. Here we see some current unemployment statistics. Notice the really high unemployment rate for Lake County, which is where Idlewild is located. You can compare that to the other statistics from surrounding counties in the area. Although things have changed for the last 50 years or so, a few years back, Idlewild was recognized as the largest and most important African-American resort in the nation, not just in the state of Michigan, not just in the Midwest, but nationally as well. Since the 20 teens, Idlewild's history has been celebrated in more and more detail. Here we see a former school that's been turned into a cultural center. There's even a series of stops that you could make on a tour of Idlewild. You can see the image for that on the right. Three major publications have come about in the last 10 years or so. Two written by Ron Stevens, who actually was a faculty member at West Shore for a short time, and another, uh, shown here, Black Eden, uh, written by a couple of professors from Western Michigan University. Well, I'd like to finish with some concluding thoughts. I'd like to summarize some key ideas. First of all, Idlewild is a local community, but one thing that's important to note is that any community is influenced by outside events. We see legalized segregation and its end had a major impact on the creation and the history of Idlewild. What you also want to be able to do is you want to be able to identify key individuals and events that shaped the early history of Idlewild. Well, that's all for today. I hope you learned something new. Take care, and we'll see you in class.